Please welcome Professor John McMurtry. His unique perspective will be on display today under the title, Why the Facts of 9-11 Are Suppressed. The subtitle is Understanding the Ruling Group Mind Behind the War Without End. I think that we've uh, ultimately got an instituted cognitive structure here that selects for not only 9-11, but what I will later call the 9-11 wars. And hence, I will explain it, beginning with the first section, whose reign of terror. A quotation begins that, the system works, Donald Rumsfeld. Civilized Americans were outraged at the torture of Iraqi prisoners by U.S. occupying forces when they found out about it. But not what started it all, the illegal war of aggression by the U.S. invasion of Iraq last year, the supreme crime under international law. Although it is reassuring that the corporate media finally broadcasts crimes against humanity instead of ignoring them, a crucial question arose in the face of the public relations onslaught by the Commander-in-Chief White House to spark American war fever again. Would the group mind slogans of the free world versus the terrorists fool the public once more? America war at war had always worked before. At the height of this damage to America's image, note the focus of concern, the Patriot card was played again and again around the clock that the Red Cross had reported that 70 to 90 percent of the torture victims were picked up at random and tortured for nothing they did, did not diminish cries for the terrorists' blood. That the official Taguba report was not permitted to question anyone above a part-time Reserve Army woman officer who was kept out of the interrogation room by U.S. Defense Intelligence did not register as evidence of top-down control that the far worse crimes of continuously maiming and killing defenseless Iraqi women and children by U.S. and allied bombing were not connected, indicated that the murderous blind eye was still closed. The ruling group mind of America was only concerned about America's image abroad. Throughout, the deep pattern was overlooked, which tells all that this U.S. regime obeys no law if it protects the life of people outside it. The examples are self-defining at every level. Sabotage laws of the community of nations from the Kyoto Protocol through the rights of children and the landmines treaty to trashing of nuclear bomb, bomb, bomb bans, covenants for economic sovereignty and against racism and atmosphere destruction. Wherever one looks across the world's fields of life need, the U.S. presidential line of command constitutes itself as above the law, including the international criminal court itself, which it applies against others with righteous fury. Denial of any charge is the first response, and then attack on any who speak up. The Bush Jr. regime is a pure type of a long pattern of criminal lawlessness whose wheel within wheels of murderous operations is the seldom discussed U.S. defense intelligence, far more powerful than the CIA. The barbaric tortures in Iraq which caused an international uproar in May 2004 had been internally and externally documented for the Pentagon since the previous year, but were ignored at the top until one thing changed. The pictures. The one thing the media public can understand were published by the mainstream media and made plausible denial no longer possible. There are no pictures of the 9-11 setup. Throughout, one rule remained intact. No one called the pub president or his directors liars. The latest big lie continued to be lost, as always, in disconnected pieces. In the background, 9-11 justified any violation of international and constitutional law as essential to the war on terrorism, the same justification used by the corporation-friendly Third Reich to invade other countries at will. Behind one corporate state was the precipitating Reichstag fire to declare war on all who stood in the way. Behind the successor military war state was 9-11. Both were based on transnational corporations working both sides. 
The 9-11 baseline to justify war on whomever one wanted, far more clearly than the Reichstag fire, was looked for long before the event. The Bush Jr. planners had already published the Lynchpin Proclamation, Project for a New American Century, a full year before 9-11 in September 2000, a public planning document in which the desired, quote, process of transformation for the U.S.'s world mission of, quote, full-spectrum dominance was made overtly contingent on, quote, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor, unquote. If the process of global military dominance was not to be, quote, a long one, unquote. It should have come as no surprise then that the wish by the men positioned to enable 9-11 was granted, with formerly financed allies executing the long-announced attack on the World Trade Center. One former agent, uh, Omar Abdel Rahman, having masterminded the first attack in 1993, financed by the U.S. And, past times, and another, Osama bin Laden, the second in 2001. Understanding the 9-11 wars. Quote, this is from Brzezinski. The United States needs unhindered financial, it's a quote from 1997. So we've had a number of warnings before it happened, including uh, from the uh, regime itself. The United States needs unhindered financial and economic access to Central Asia's natural resources, especially the enormous economic prize of the natural oil and gas located in the region. But it will be difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues, except in the circumstances of a truly massive and widely perceived external direct threat." Unquote. The deepest mystery of 9-11 itself is why the facts contradicting the official story have been silenced in public and media discussion, with even left websites refusing to engage the meaning. I had a debate with Michael Al uh, uh, Albert, for example, on Znet, and he just, would, uh, just avoided it continuously, the whole issue. The taboo against knowing the facts is here encoded into the identity structure itself. Even the plain fact that there was an unprecedented delay on 9-11 of standard plane intercept routines for over 70 minutes, normally 10 minutes long, until all the target buildings had been hit, still remains publicly unspeakable years later. <clears throat> no one denies the fact, excuse me. <clears throat> but it is, quote, conspiracy theory to mention it. This is the dead silence operation of the ruling group mind that locks out all thought and evidence with do, which do not fit its baseline presuppositions. Given the known pre-11-9-11 uh, search by uh, U.S. Ge geostrategic planning for a publicly saleable reason to invade Central Asia and Iraq, as the Brzezinski Four quote in the Project for the New American Century revealed to us, why did the media, citizens, and other governments continue to, to disconnect 9-11's strange occurrence from what it provided the ideal pretext for? Militarily impose new control and access over Iraqi and Central Asian oil. Specifically, its supply its, and its sale and its access across the world's richest oil reserve. We knew of these aims before they were made fact. Why then, when these very major invasions then occurred one on top of the, uh, uh, the other after 9-11, the sole context within which they could have been sold as defensive, does even dominant left analysis refuse to connect the dots? In the U.S. itself, almost no one, including the heroic Noam Chomsky, engages the question. Even the recent most developed factual analysis among almost none features an exonerating title, the new Pearl Harbor. Even after years of known lying about Iraq by the Bush administration, why do the media and foreign affairs respondents still continue to block out all evidence substantiating the hypothesis of a constructed 9-11 attack? For obvious example, the anonymously blocked FBI investigations before 9-11, the ignored intelligence warnings from many foreign state agencies, and the immediately prior visit of the Pakistani intelligence ISI pay uh, paymaster of one of the lead hijackers. Why are even the basics of physical science ignored in understanding the attack? 
the building collapses whose velocity of fall from plane impacts alone contradicts the laws of gravitation and engineering physics. Again, there is no counter evidence or argument. There is just disconnection from and between the facts across the left-right spectrum. Now, given the Bush administration's endless stalling, blocking, and attack dog treatment of those chafing at top level in action before 9-11, including the FBI director of anti-terrorism, John O'Neill, who died in the attack, and later the Bush administration's own official chief advisor on counterterrorism, Richard Clark, what more evidence is required for the wall of the unthinkable to be moved? How can the long-prepared plans for war crime invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, which 9-11 alone justified to the public, not be connected across the dots by still thinking people? How could anyone co coherently believe that, quote, and this is John Kerry's quote, and he's a careful man, quote, the most crooked, lying group I've ever seen, unquote, about the Bush uh, Jr. administration's string pullers were somehow not in. How could you coherently think that they weren't in on what, quote, all the buzz in Washington, as well as foreign intelligence circles, were warning about right to the day? If many followed defense warning, I'm sorry, followed these warnings not to be in the buildings or on the relevant flights on that day, how could U.S. defense intelligence and the CIA not know? How could it happen if they did not? Consider the secret command coordination, which is everywhere at work in the U.S. national security state apparatus. Then think through the multi-level stand-down of preventative procedures, which were essential to allow 9-11 to occur, and did allow 9-11 to occur, at every level from immigration to flight control to defense intelligence and the CIA. If one remembers the record of sacrifices of countless thousands of people to covert geopolitical strategies of which the U.S. corporate security state is known already to be capable, what could be the cognitive disorder which could block the recognition of these connected facts and their meaning? How can a normal intelligence really think that the Bush Jr. cabal of operators who've arranged the usurpation of the U.S. presidency and have waged a mass murderous war by false pretext with the very lead operators who have presided over death squads and criminal secret deals destroying countless lives since the Reagan era, how could we think they would be too virtuous to manipulate a long-planned event by familiar people which gave them unheard of new powers. When they know from all experience that they can play the card of America at war against anyone who challenges the president and commander-in-chief, why would they reject the heaven-sent fulfillment of their known wish list by 9-11? The motivations for murderous crimes of state and successful distancing from them are the warp and woof of history. All Henry II required to murder the Archbishop of Canterbury was a question in front of those who served him. Would we not have to be foolish to assume that the power corrupted men facing enmeshment in the greatest electoral uh, scandal and business frauds in U.S. history and a sliding economy under their watch would just turn away from an allowing event which would reverse their fortunes? An unprecedented world powers at stake. Would it be rational for such men to turn down the greatest opportunity of history to establish the empire of, quote, full spectrum dominance they planned on, on the basis of just such a fast track event to save fewer lives? Would they do this to save fewer lives than three months of domestic traffic accidents? The corporate market calculus all lived by would not be deterred by such an externality any more than the oil business they come from is concerned about far more deaths from their pollutions and extractions. Yet there is a deep structure of consciousness at work, beyond the beneficiaries which denies even the self-evident, and all our media right here in Toronto are in on it, not consciously. There is a level of identity that operates beneath facts, and it is a structure of prejudice, prejudice, prejudgment, which selects what facts are and are not seen, are connected, 
One needs to remember here that the lead group of the Bush top secret team is much of the same personnel that presided over the smuggling of cocaine into the U.S. to addict Americans so as to illegally finance war crimes against Nicaragua, and before that plotted with and provided arms to the mullah dictatorship of Iran so that it held on to American hostages long enough for the election to be lost by Jimmy Carter to the Reagan regime. Even without this larger historical context in view, and it's the same people like Elliot Abrams and so on and Cheney who are involved, within which, in fact, Cheney and Rumsfeld have worked at the top from the beginning, what evidence in the real world does the mainstream of North America have to believe that the very same people in political networking who boldly stole the 2000 presidential election by overriding legal voting procedures and rode on Enron jets and criminally provided financing to get there, and who still try to push through a national energy policy secretly advised by the same fraudulent operators, why would we think they're above letting 9-11 occur to win world power for themselves? Why most simply considered as the most elementary known principle and question of forensic judgment, justice, in the face of any crime, qui bono, who benefits, suspended here on 9-11, excuse me. <clears throat> Note throughout that no mass media in the US or Canada, nor any democratic opposition politician including uh, presidential candidate Kerry, raises the most basic of all issues, qui bono. What explains why the self-evident is unthinkable? There's something at work within and across people's consciousness as citizens and consumers which is not yet penetrated. Some form of instituted mind lock blocks out the normal first question. It would lead us to the first forensic hypothesis that there was a complicit blind eye to what maximally served this administration's self-interest above all and no one else's. But we know that the most obvious hypothesis has been prohibited from view on pain of a burning, quote, a burning necklace of fire around the questioner's neck, to quote Dan Rather's words. Even when all the evidence pointed in the direction of the most important news story of the era and there was no counter evidence, such as hard losses suffered by anyone at the top of the most unaccountable and pervasive failure of the most advanced international security apparatus in history, still the question remained publicly unspeakable. Why would the most basic forensic question and facts continue to be overlooked when only ever more gains for this ruling group and their oil men, military constituencies piled one on top of another from 9-11 on? Why would no one mention the vast and global new powers over nearly everyone which 9-11 reaped for everybody at the top of this corporate state cabal? Why would the most elementary logic of any normal reading of criminal intent and action, whose interests are alone served, remain unthinkable? That is a mystery. Not once anywhere in public discourse that I know of, not in one piece of an around-the-clock saturating field of media and learned messages, have the interests served by 9-11 for those in control been once named. So let us name them here open access to the world's formerly untouchable and greatest wealth resources, new command position over public financing for subordinate militaries and police apparatuses, not only in the U.S. but across the globe, privatization of the world's richest publicly owned and state-controlled oil fields and the social infrastructures they support, almost no mention of that, new declared right to suspend the historical basis of rule by law, habeas corpus, and whatever civil, other civil rights are targeted. The CAUT has a nice uh, analysis of this recently. New legitimation of a president who lost the election until a legal mass invalidation of votes by Bush state officials and a stacked Supreme Court overturned state laws for vote recount. Public diversion from the regime's known corrupt support and energy policy determination by the most criminally fraudulent corporate leadership in American history. Unprecedented new powers for price leveraging of oil supply. That's you've got our price of oil right now, one can see what happens. And military services for, quote, a war without end. 
You police powers across borders to imprison without right of legal defense anyone deemed to obstruct an international trade or other meeting in the future and in crowning glory unlimited new rights of men with chicken hawk pasts to command everyone else in new ways with ever more fawning media attention as men of will of iron. How could anyone of sane mind not connect the staggering gains by these people to the same people's failures to protect against 9-11, which provided all the new powers? The problem of denial runs deep into the collective psyche. The anomaly to be explained is how in an open society of cynical market calculation, the most evident facts of ruling group gain at almost everybody else's increasing expense can be so successfully repressed. I can't believe that is a sign pointing back to the block behind it. Even the consuming public's insatiable desire to know the dark secrets of the rich and famous is here still. Something deeper than regime propaganda is at work. Those who believe that the in-group running the U.S. national security state could not possibly have been involved in 9-11 are by self-admission no longer connected to the issue of fact or truth. They move within a deeper regime of meaning which operates across individuals and classes and beneath reason. They are moved from underneath by a pre-scientific field of hysteria, denials, and projections which propelled two criminal invasions, war criminal invasions and occupations, and police state uh, laws across the world in under three years. We confront here, in short, a primeval world of the group mind, harnessed to the global market's military juggernaut and a bottomless consumer maw that only desires more. With war fever as its moving passion, the atomized masses are made one in a salvational fantasy of self-proving triumph over the enemy, which is seen everywhere. All step to the march of the group mind's meta-program by which experience and perception are themselves organized. This is the ordering framework of consciousness in terms of which coherence and meaning are found in whatever is selected for attack. However false the justifications or defenseless the victims might be, even the doomsday bombing of innocent poor peoples on a constructed pretext is perceived through the prism of this ruling group mind as a war for goodness and freedom. This is an old pattern in American expansion of continental and global market power, but it becomes fanatic in a new way with the construction of 9-11. Few dare to see the propelling mindset behind. In the 9-11 turn, one stigma phrase has held the group mind in a set point of compliance that asks no questions. Conspiracy theory is the term of art for the silencing operation. Fear of ridicule does the rest. In consequence, the 9-11 attack has permitted what was impossible before it. It has allowed an illegitimate administration to transmute into America's patriot champion at war, above accountability and the rule of law. Defending America from another terrorist attack, quote, has in this way become a political blank check for corporate corruption of government with impunity, war criminal acts and threats across the Islamic world without limit, and attacks on civil rights and public commons everywhere. This is the theater of America's war without end. A war which bestows new rights to dispossess, intimidate, imprison, and kill those who oppose, and more deeply ignore the world's increasingly grave environmental and social problems which deepen under the global market regime. It is a war which crosses oceans and borders, a fiat reality which blocks out any effective attention or policy to the global crisis and its systemic causes. It has captured not just one government and people as in past wars to divert populations, but the entire world, which is, quote, either for the U.S. or for the terrorists, unquote. The public sector is thereby rendered impotent in formation of social policies and infrastructure to meet the life and death problems of the failing global market paradigm. Many thinking people understand the geostrategic pattern at work here, but not the regulating mechanisms of the pathogenic group mind that orders every one of the steps. It is the system decider behind every false terror scare, diversionary attack, big lie and violation of international law since 9-11. It is its meta program. Its primary economic expression is global privatization of public resources by force as well as fraud. Terrorists instead of communists are the diversionary enemy. What is in fact attacked at every level in, in 
important on the ground is any social formation which blocks access to the last great frontier for corporate exploitation and control of our epoch. Public resources and spaces of every kind, including thought itself. This is the cold meaning of the Bush administration's endless mantra of our freedom. That is, full spectrum control, freedom for full spectrum control, or access to everything of priceable value with no outer or inner perimeter to its invasion. That's the key. The trigger cause of the US war state is a 9-11 attack on America, quote, but its binding lie is freedom. U.S. investment interests and defense installations increasingly span the globe in the name of everybody else's liberation. 9-11 is the pivot on which it all turns. In the background, David Rockefeller advised the corporate elect of the beacon of solution long ago. A supranational sovereignty, and this is a quote from him, a, a supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers, unquote, he long ago explained at the June 1991 Bildersburg Annual Meeting, quote, is surely preferable to the national autodetermination practiced in past centuries. National autodetermination is what's being eliminated. In the foreground, devout 9-11 story believers await the rapture to come. For all the magic of the invisible hand infallibly transfigures infinite self-desire into the best of all possible worlds. That's right into neoclassical economics now, and I'll soon be into that. The optimum means the best of all possible worlds. The 9-11 turn to war across the Middle East, Baghdad, and Central Asia is in this moral universe the intersection of divine plan and history, with God's modern chosen nation now fulfilling the grand mission to liberate peoples everywhere to the promised land of the global free market, with no public realm left anywhere unsubjugated to market disciplines and chief executive command. It's all modeled on the corporate hierarchy of command. The regulating group mind behind the 9-11 or the global market wars at the core of the borderless meta program, which regulates the perception and understanding of our epoch, lies the ruling group mind. Its ancestor predates the US as a nation, but corporate America and its president express its last global armed crusade. Not even the more ancient duty of the colonial state to build infrastructure instead of destroy it inhibits the pure corporate capitalist form of US empire. Not even the life security of Americans' own citizens figures into the money sequence system into which all that exists is converted. From the water we drink to the genes of what we eat, from the countries of the non-market world to the sky over our heads. For the conversion of all life organization and their conditions into commodities and money demand and perpetual growth is known to be identical to our freedom. Thus, only more market money transactions for price commodities for a profit with no life coordinates anywhere involved count in our national accounts today, including Canada's national account, as development or well-being. This is the inner meaning of what is called, quote, the free world. The fatal problem was evident to Abraham Lincoln over a century ago, and this is not much quoted. Lincoln warned in a private letter Quote, as a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned by the war, as usual, and an era of corruption in high places will follow. And the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed, unquote. That's Lincoln. Lincoln was assassinated within a few months, five months of that letter. To a colonel. U.S. corporate rule has since been instituted across the world and now triumphalist over all alternatives invades across the world wherever there is room for quote more freedom and development for its money sequencing operations. Whether the civil common sectors and unpriced life spaces within existing capitalist societies or the entire economy and resource stocks of non-capitalist societies which are defenseless against attack. The inner logic of the corporate order's globalization is not dependent on this or that administration, and that's important to remember. 
It is a meta program of regulating assumptions, and it has sedimented it over centuries into the ruling mindset of our epoch. Its principles are now mathematically enshrined in neoclassical market models, but they are also the regulators of everyday thought across the world. As with the one true faith of a former age, the ruling principles are variously comprehended and normally, normally function at the pre-conscious level. No one safely challenges, however, any of them. In order to understand the through line of the market, the ruling market group mine since Adam Smith published its first testament in the year of the American Revolution, we need to understand its system deciding principles which form the bare metaphysic of the 9-11 wars. This thing goes deep. Together, these principles set the logic of the ruling group mind and the meaning of its invisible hand tech theology out of which the 9-11 turning point and the new market wars have been fanatic expressions. The regulating structure of market perception and understanding is the determiner of social meaning to which official culture in both industrial and third world societies now tacitly conforms since the end of the opposing superpower in 1991. The fall of the Soviet state marked the decisive turning point in the ascension of the market group mind as having no alternative, the end of history. 9-11 marks marked a less understood turning point in this meta program's global dominance by legitimating preemptive attack on any movement or force force perceived to stand in the way of its freedom and self-defense whether unarmed quote violence threatening protesters unquote in domestic public spaces or quote suspected terrorists unquote in civilian populations of the occupied world Behind all the infinite variations of times and conditions of which postmodernism is the bacchanalian rebel, one unexamined meta program of perception and judgment has increasingly ruled as the system deciding market group mind. Its inner logic determines every step of the global market crusade by the U.S. war state before and especially since 9 11, with the latter providing it its carte blanche. What by the U.S. war state before, sorry, <clears throat> what before 9-11 was a world slowly coming under universal norms of life protection and understanding of the destructive life blindness of global markets, the global market system, was, after 9-11, a monoculture of one enemy which was disconnected from every real problem humanity faces. That's the big disconnection. We need to keep in mind here that it was one month before 9-11 that the greatest international demonstration ever against the global market system occurred. With NATO warplanes flying overhead in Genoa and police beating masses of demonstrators while they slept on false pretexts of terrorism amongst them. 9-11 reversed the historical tide forming against the global corporate system its most concealed function. The inner algorithm of command of the global market system itself was war drummed out of view. The bearer of this determining algorithm of the mega machine is the ruling market group mind, and it is regulated by the following set of principles to which all of official culture conforms without question, including our own. One, and I'm just, this is the bear type, and I'm moving towards the end now. Pursuit in a market over order of maximal monetary assets and commodities for oneself is natural for humans, social progress and development. Two, there is no rightful limit on acquisition of these market assets, assets and all things, or any countervailing right to redistribution of their holdings, however unequal they become. Leo Strauss, the man behind the uh, National Security Council for years in the U.S., the theoretician, uh, says uh, that uh, limitless accumulation of private capital is the highest moral duty. Three. Freedom to buy and sell and self-maximizing transactions of money and price commodities is the basis of all human liberty and justice, and there is no outer limit in its rightful globalization. Four, the market money, market's money price system always, always optimally allocates resources and distributes goods and services in each and every society to ensure the best of all possible worlds. Five, I mean, this, this is all deducible for or axiomatized in neoclassical theory. 
Money profit maximization by investors is the ultimate engine of economic so and social advance and is maximally liberated from the dead hand of state regulation and ownership. Six, government intervention, therefore, in the self-regulating market is wrong unless it supports the market system and dictatorial in proportion to replacement of free market flows of market commodities and capital. And this is why we can understand what's going on in Venezuela and Haiti before the uh, and so on. Seven, individual consumer desires are permanently increasing and unlimited in their growth by human nature and are what all free people want more to satisfy. Eight, the public interests in human health welfare are only increased by a market economy which produces all that is good, including democracy, poverty alleviation, and human civilization. Market growth is therefore beneficial in all places in time with no limit to the conversion of planetary and human life organization into more priced goods for consumers and profits for firms. Protection of uh, domestic production of any type is the evil of protectionism, although subsidization of dominant enterprises may be necessary to the national interest. 11. Whatever facts of life disaster may seem to contradict the necessity and validity of market principles 1 through 10, the ones I just read, they are always understood as corrected by better application and more rigorous application of market principles. 12. If the creative destruction, as it's called, of the global market destroys old environments and ways of life, these are unavoidable costs of technological progress to be solved by market means. 13. Individuals, groups, or governments which doubt or criticize, and here we get the war uh, drum beginning, the supremacy of the market system or the inherent efficiency of its production and distribution or the freedom of its agents, thereby reject the free market and therefore democracy. And there, therefore, it follows by transitivity, dangerous to humanity. 14, any and all societies, parties, or governments which seek any lived alternative, and this is always what they attack, any lived alternative of economic organization are, to the extent of this, irrational or evil and must be prevailed over by all means available, including armed force, and I would add 9-11, to protect and advance the free world for all. That's the meta program. A simple question tests the hold of these principles. What government, mass medium, or neoclassical economist does not conform to each and all of them? The Bush Jr. administration may be specially extreme in pushing the globalized free market by force of arms on false pretexts, but which of these principles is transgressed in speech or policy by even leaders of this administration's opponents? Who suggests that Iraq should be left free to pursue, pursue its own choice of a socialist path? More challengingly, we may ask, which was set up all along before Sudan, what market principle in any way rules out war criminal invasion of non-market societies? Or more challenging, we may ask, how would the allowance of 9-11, the engineering of 9-11 itself, violate any market principle? The answer is that it does not. The only cost recognized by the market value calculus is a cost to business. Lives are worth nothing. Only market incomes are. In fact, no high income executive, another strange fact not uh, investigated, seems to have been there on 9-11 and the costs were borne by the public. As for the U.S. market itself, it was already in a deep slide before 9-11 stimulated massive new government spending. The market recession was, of course, blamed on the terrorist attack, but that is an operation of the market group mind. Any facts which do not fit its assumptions are preconsciously inverted and reversed so that they do. More revealingly, the market meta program favors 9-11 by favoring its consequences. Destruction of a socialist state or an Islamic society for replacement by a free market is the maximum good possible for it. If we see through this moral prism, the set points of market understanding, only necessary and beneficent effects appear through the lenses of perception. Who could disagree with overthrow of an alien state dictatorship, two of them, sitting near or on the global market's most precious and increasingly needed wealth? The magic thinking of Margaret 
market logic then cascades into optimal states of expectation afterwards. Extension of more efficient market relations of production and distribution, distribution to the locked-in resources of, uh, pe and people involved. New private capital formations and freedoms. Opportunities for spectacular market growth where no, there, before there was none. Relief of consumers from inefficient Arab monopoly of oil. A competitive price system to properly deploy and allocate resources instead of an Islamic or socialist prison keeping the people in backward dependency on handouts and subsidies. And historic new vistas for foreign capital and local entrepreneurs to lead undeveloped Afghanistani and Iraqi societies out of the dark ages to the summum bunum of, a, of the era. The first Islamic market miracle. Certainly such market magic thinking and blindness to life facts has been abundantly evidenced already from the planning of the invasion on. Complete absence of any post-invasion plan to rebuild the economy shattered by two saturation bombings and 12 years of U.S. enforced sanctions. To restore the destroyed life infrastructure that had killed over 500,000 ch children, or indeed to do anything but let an imagined liberation and market miracle spontaneously recreate a society from the genocide of the society, the socialist society, over 12 years. This revealed a derangement of mind disconnected from the life world, but no one has yet followed it back to its source. The complete incapacity of the market state invaders to plan for or provide even public security of the most basic infrastructures of water and electricity, let alone food and employment or health care or education or freedom from attack, in most of which Iraq had led the region in development prior to the first invasion, the key ignored fact, revealed a superstitious structure of market logic at work. Could any mumming of slogans and systematic destruction of life systems from the dark ages rival this continuously barbaric outcome? Yet what market principle selects any, against any step? The deep prejudice of the market calculus that it is lifeblind in principle and can only compute money sequences and sums. The same set point of perception and value judgment reaches back to 9-11 and before. The unspeakable truth is that no market principle is not better realized through the 9-11 attack, and that's why people keep saying it's better. Okay, it has to be better. If 9-11 had not been planned by the ex-ally bin Laden and enacted by the, quote, moral equivalents of the founding fathers, unquote, as Reagan called the Taliban and their allies in the uh, finance, U.S. finance war against another secular socialist government, what else could have justified the new global market wars? Market logic is the hidden system decider throughout. One more level of the meta program of the mind, however, is required to propel and legitimate its supreme crimes against humanity as acts of self defense and liberation. That is the religion of America, and it expresses a global market program as a war crusade across the world with America as the Messiah state. The layer, this layer of the ruling group mind is what directly regulates the hearts and minds of America. It's their daily frame of reference and fixed pole star. This mind can only feel and see inside its own closed circle. U.S., our own group, in the master phrase of the philosopher King Leo Strauss. The ruling group locates the group mind it shares with the people by poles of opinion and arrives at the narcissist center for everything in the religion of America, America itself. What is of everywhere else angry at lawless U.S.-led destruction of planetary life organization is reversed now into a hatred of America, the new correlative of anti-Semitism. Here or there, the narcissist self-center can only go one place, back to itself as good, and others as jealous or evil. Clinically, psychiatry knows the disorder as a propensity to auto-suggestive hysteria and disconnection from reality, have descriptors. When psychopathic, diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders suggests, the self-center lies glibly, manipulates others, is parasitic, and denies all responsibility for destructive actions. The clinical definitions and the reality meet, but do not give us the regulating frame of mind through which it, see it sees and comprehends 
the syntax of meaning in terms of which it knows itself as free and good. <clears throat> Last, the group mind of America, the second coming by force of arms. The moral syntax of the American group mind is the wheel within the wheel of the global market religion. All its principles are presupposed as the way that God is presupposed by the religious fundamentalists. An all-powerful, all-knowing, and jealous ruler of the world rightfully determines the course of reality, and none may doubt it. We may know of the pre-reformation pre Islam that is the primitive counterpart, but we do not know the beast itself. We sense it in U.S. witch hunts and vast prisons of the poor doing no offense to any person. 86% are there for no harm to the person. But we do not see the creed's fanatical mode in the global market's expansion led by the U.S. in the war crusade that has no end and understands itself as freedom. The God of America is primitive. It worships itself. But there are a set of silently regulating principles at work through all the phenomena of its rule, which together constitute the ruling group mind, which has imprisoned global culture within its premises since 9-11. And I'm only going to give one, but it's the key one. The ultimately regulating premise of this ruling group mind is that the U.S. national security state is America. This assertion is never directly stated because that would reveal the absurdity of the equation. But the assumption nevertheless regulates every statement on Americans' relations with the rest of the world, which have been proclaimed from the U.S. government since 9-11. It, it, in turn, is rooted in a deep cultural corality which it expresses in Leviathan form. The state does. And the deep cultural form is, I can kill, therefore I am. This is a logic that goes back to before Hegel's master-slave dialectic first glorified its threat as the source of philosophy. There is almost no popular form of American culture that does not bear its undertow meaning. From hunting, WrestleMania, and video games to the language of sports and dramatic content of television and movie entertainments. We won't explain, explore this meaning here but will consider only the institutionalized form of it on the world stage. The equation of meaning between the U.S. Armed Forces Command and war and intelligence apparatus and America itself as a country and increasingly Canada. The pre this preconscious equation explains, for example, why even the U.S. government's official opposition, the Democratic Party, abdicated from political responsibility in its fear of appearing to oppose unjustified wars against essentially defenseless third world societies. They too are all incarcerated within the ruling structure of mind, more paralyzed than 1930 Germans in their dread of being named unpatriotic. This is a fear which can only be explained by the equation of the state military command and its apparatus with America. Beneath the surface phenomena of party politics and competing media and opinions, the great diversity, rules one group mind. The equation of America to its armed state apparatus is never publicly challenged in the official culture of the free world because the equation is assumed a priori. No one who houses the false equation can tell them apart. They cannot see, the, therefore, the demonstrable falsehoods of the war state the overthrow of the Republic's democratic traditions, and least of all the safety of millions of innocent civilians in other countries, not to say the 2,600 deaths of U.S. citizens, because they assume America and its national security apparatus are one and the same. Since they love America and America is it, and we love America as their neighbor, none of us can distinguish between our beloved country and the criminal gang institutions of the National Security Council, the Pentagon, and the CIA. As these rogue secret societies, especially the U.S. Uh, um, intelligence, uh, defense intelligence, as these rogue secret societies rule on behalf of U.S. investments across the world by the force of armed terror, mass disinformation, secret narco links, and political bribery and coercion at every level, lovers of America are obliged to defend this monstrous construction as America. This equation and the president as the president. This equation obliges them to be blind to fact. 
It then misleads them into supposing that anyone who opposes a gangster state rule of the world is anti-American. One absurd equation develops and builds on another and ends as a paranoid mass cult characterized as patriotism, just as in the 1930s with the world's most powerful industrial state. It is this false equation at the baseline of the group mind that we find the kernel of our world's problem. America's self-definition is capacity to kill others, unbound by international law. 9-11 is both the karmic blowback and the launching site of this self-equation in the global market war for empire without end. Thank you.